Hey class, I'm Mr Thornton and I'm going to help you succeed in your GCSE. This lesson, alkanes and alkenes part one, their structure. This topic's been requested by a lot of people, including Zelda Tardis, Michael Morandu, Charlotte Harris, Rail Whale, Ella Hyman, McFreeman, RJ Boy, London Manny, Chloe Botton, Maria Sony, Adam Patel, Joe Wilde, Smackdown Gaming, Leo Yang, The King of Comeback, Krev M, Emma Bell, and I am Calvin. Thanks guys. If you've got a topic which you'd like me to cover, then just leave a comment below. The topic of alkanes and alkenes is pretty much the same across all the different exam specifications. For both the legacy specifications, those are the ones whose final exams will be in 2017, and the new specifications as well, who will have their first exams in 2018. There is almost no difference between all of those different ones. There is one key difference though on all of the new specifications, and that is the term homologous series. They want you to know about the homologous series of alkanes, or they'll use phrasing similar to that. In fact, the phrasing's pretty much identical on all of the different specifications. This didn't appear on the old ones. And I think the fact that it's on all those new ones and the fact that it's the same phrase on all those new ones suggests that it's someone at central government when these schemes were being approved who had a real bee in their bonnet about this phrase for whatever reason. But it's really simple. Homologous series just means a group of things which are all similar to each other. Uh, those of you who are doing alkanes and alkenes on the legacy papers you probably already knew that they are pretty similar molecules to one another. The only real difference is they get steadily longer as you go along the series. So that's all that it means. Homologous series just means a group of things which are similar to each other. I'd be surprised if they ask you to define that in an exam paper, but I wouldn't be surprised if on new exam papers they throw that phrase at you just to try and put you off. Uh, they've done similar sorts of things, for example, talking about potential difference instead of voltage on the physics papers. So just be prepared for that. It's actually a really simple concept, a bunch of things which are similar. One word which they do like to get you to define, however, is hydrocarbons. All of the alkanes and alkenes are hydrocarbons, and they like to check that you know what this term means. Most of you probably already know this, but for those of you who don't, a hydrocarbon is just something which contains hydrogen and carbon hence the name. It's pretty simple and straightforward. Uh, because hydrogen and carbon are non-metals, these hydrocarbons are bonded together, like all non-metal molecules, they're bonded together with covalent bonds. So all of them are covalent bonds, and all of them just contain hydrogen and carbon. All of the alkanes and alkenes are, to a greater or lesser degree, flammable. They will burn in oxygen, and if they've got enough oxygen there, then you form the products which oxygen always forms with carbon and with hydrogen. That is carbon dioxide and water. So if you see any equation where they're asking you to complete an equation saying what would be produced when an alkane or an alkene burns, it's always going to be carbon dioxide and water. Of course it'll be water vapour because it'll be very warm having been produced during a combustion reaction, but still water. Speaking of water, none of the alkanes or alkenes are soluble in water. If you mix them with water and stir it up or shake it up, it will still separate back out into two distinct layers. Now the reason for this is water is what we call a polar molecule. I'm not going to get into a huge amount of detail because you don't really need to know a huge amount of detail, but the short version is that water molecules are slightly negatively charged on the uh, oxygen atom in that water molecule and slightly positively charged on the hydrogen atoms in that water molecule, which tends to pull water molecules towards each other, a little bit like magnets. In fact, it's electromagnetism which is causing that process to happen. Now this means that if there is anything which isn't a polar molecule, that's basically anything which doesn't have an oxygen connected to a hydrogen, causing that same distribution of charge, if there's anything which isn't a polar molecule, it won't dissolve in that water. And what's more, as those water molecules pull each other together, they force those other molecules out of the way. Now you'll talk about this more when we look at detergents and emulsifiers, but for the time being, what you really need to know is simply that alkanes and alkenes do not dissolve in water. Essentially, these compounds are all related to oils. Now, of course, some oils are much less viscous than others, some are much more viscous than others, 
but they all sort of have the same basic properties. Well, oils are pretty much made up of things like alkanes and alkenes. They're mainly hydrocarbons themselves, which is why you get these same sorts of properties. In fact, the oil which we get out of the ground, crude oil, contains an awful lot of different length uh, hydrocarbons. Long and short chains of alkanes and alkenes all mixed together. This is one of our main sources of the alkanes and alkenes. Now one key use of oils is that they are very unreactive with the group 1 metals, lithium, sodium, potassium. And so quite often lithium and sodium and potassium, if you've ever used them in the lab, they'll be stored underneath oils so that they don't react with the oxygen in the air or don't react with any water vapour in the air. I'm sure you've seen the reactions of lithium and, so and sodium and potassium with water. The fact that our alkanes and alkenes don't react with lithium or sodium or potassium means that these are good candidates for things to store the sodium and the lithium and the potassium under. Okay, so that's why lithium and sodium and potassium are stored under some sort of oil. So to summarize those properties, and this summary is really going to cover everything in the amount of detail that you really need to remember, all of the alkanes and alkenes are hydrocarbons. They are all bonded covalently, that is, all of the atoms join onto other atoms by sharing electrons in their outer shell, rather than one atom stealing electrons from another. Uh, they're all made of hydrogen and carbon. And so when you burn them in plenty of oxygen, you form carbon dioxide and water. And also, they don't react with things like sodium. So remember, a homologous series is a series of things which are all kind of similar to each other. All those properties which I just listed, those are all strong similarities between all of the alkanes and the alkenes. There are differences though. One of the key differences is how many carbon atoms are in that molecule. And in fact, we name different molecules relating to how many carbon atoms there are. Let's start out with the alkanes because it's the easiest one to start with. This is a typical alkane. There's a group of carbon atoms in a chain there. Carbon is really good at forming these long chains of molecules. And coming off the side and off each end, there are hydrogen atoms. And you could have all sorts of different numbers of carbon atoms in this chain. You could have just one in a chain, or you could have a couple. You could have incredibly long chains with potentially hundreds of atoms in that chain. Our naming conventions tell us how many atoms are in that chain. You only really need to know about the first four though. The prefix of each of these names relates to how many carbon atoms there are. So let's run through those quickly and you do need to learn these. First, if there's one carbon atom, then the name of that compound starts with meth, or it's sometimes pronounced meth, depending on what sort of molecule it is. When we get onto things like alcohols, that crops up again. But I'm not going to focus on that in this video. That will come up in a later video. So, meth is one carbon atom. Then after that, we've got eth, which is two carbon atoms. Then we've got prope, which is three, and bute, which is four. So meth, eth, prope, bute. Each one of those tells us how many carbon atoms there are. Now, after these four, it gets two prefixes which you are probably very familiar with. The next one after this is pentane, if you've got five carbon atoms. So exactly the same as a pentagon. In fact, the prefixes are just the same as with shapes from this point out. So five is pentane, and after that, hexane, and so on. You don't need to worry about that though. It's just these ones which you really need to learn. And in fact, you could probably figure out all of those on your own anyway. So one is meth, two is eth, three is prope, and four is bute. The second part of the name tells you whether or not it's an alkane or an alkene. And this is really simple. Alkanes all end in ane. Alkenes all end in ene. Now this can be a little bit subtle when you're reading a piece of text on an exam paper, for example. So do keep an eye out for it. Make sure that you know whether you're looking at an alkane or an alkene from the name. Because Propane and propene are different compounds, and although they are similar and have similar properties, three carbons in each, for example, they still do have a key difference. Before we get onto the difference between alkanes and alkenes, let's just take a look at the chemical formula for each of these alkanes. So for methane, we've got a formula of CH4. We've got one carbon and we've got four hydrogens. For ethane, it's C2H6. For propane, it's C3H8. 
for butane, it's C4H10. And you can see that as we increase the number of carbons by one, we're also increasing the number of hydrogens by two. And in fact, there's a pattern here which we can express in a more general form because the number of hydrogens is always equal to double the number of carbons plus two. So let's look at methane. We've got one carbon there. If we double the number of carbons, that'll give us two. And if we add two to that, that'll give us four. That's how many hydrogens we've got. Same for ethane. If we double the number of carbons to get four and then add two to get six, that's how many hydrogens we've got. Chemists represent this with a formula. The formula will be this, CnH2n plus 2. All that means is whatever number of carbons you've got, the hydrogens is just double that plus 2. That n stands for any number at all. So you could stick a million in there and you would have 2 million and 2 hydrogens. So that much is pretty straightforward. Now let's focus on the difference between alkanes and alkenes. And there is only really one key difference. Alkenes have a carbon-carbon double bond. That is a bond which goes from one carbon to another carbon atom and then another bond, exactly the same sort of covalent bond as the first one, which also goes from the same first carbon atom to the same second carbon atom. So it's two covalent bonds going between a pair of atoms rather than just the usual one. That's all that this means. And so that gives us a slightly different situation because if those carbons are bonded to each other, then they're going to be bonded to less hydrogens. That also means that our naming conventions are ever so slightly different because you can't get a bond between two carbon atoms if you've only got one carbon atom. So there is no methene because that's a nonsense. There's only one carbon atom if it's meth but all alkenes have to have a minimum of two carbon atoms because there's got to be a bond between two of them. It's no new information for you to learn, so it's not really a big deal that, but be aware that your alkenes start at ethene. That's the simplest one because there's got to be two carbons as a minimum. So two carbons in an alkene gives us ethene, just as two carbons in an alkane gave us ethane. If you get three carbons, you get propene, and then butene, and then so on. The exam boards only really seem to care that you know about ethene and propene, though. They don't really care about the others. Really, it's just application of those prefixes which you've already looked at and already had to learn for alkanes, so I'm not sure why they only specify that you only need to know about ethene and propene, but hey, it's a little bit less for you to worry about. Now that carbon-carbon double bond gives us an interesting property for these alkenes. Let's just compare ethane and ethene once more. And you can see that because those carbons have bonded to one another, that means there's less room for the hydrogens to get in there. There's less room for hydrogens to be a part of this molecule. In the alkane, you can see that we've managed to fill all the possible spaces where hydrogens could go. But in this alkene, it's a bit like there's still room for more hydrogens to go in there. And all of the alkenes are like this. We say they're unsaturated. That just means that, in effect, we could stick more hydrogen in there. Now, you may be used to using the term saturated to talk about oils and fats when you're going shopping for things at the supermarket. Actually, it's the same process. Unsaturated oils and fats, which you might get in food, they have less hydrogen stuck in them than saturated oils and fats. It's exactly chemically the same sort of relationship because, of course, all these molecules are the same sorts of molecule, really. You don't need to worry too much about that either, though. All you need to be aware of is all of these alkenes are unsaturated molecules. There's room to stick more atoms in there. And that actually makes these alkenes a bit more reactive than the alkanes. So that covers the structure of alkanes and alkenes. In part two, I'm going to look at how we can then test for them once we know what this structure is and how that structure affects their behavior and uses. I hope that video really helped you. To see what else I can help you with, there's lots more videos to check out on my channel. Scroll down the main page there to see I've already sorted them into playlists to help you find the video you need. You can also check out my revision guides which cover everything you need to know for the exam. They feature links to my videos, 
revision tips cover both foundation and higher tier, and unlike a lot of revision guides, they also point out what you don't need to waste time learning. If you want to check your learning, try the Snap Quiz website and app, which allow you to identify which areas you need to spend the most time learning. Remember, this is the only YouTube channel which brings you the teachers, the textbooks and the tests all on your terms, on mobile phone, tablet or computer for you to revise when you want and how you want, even immediately before you go into the exam. All of these links and any others for this video will be down in the description. Lastly, it really does help my channel if you want to leave likes, if you subscribe, or if you know someone else who's having trouble, tell them to search for Mr. Thornton. Good luck in your GCSEs everyone, and thanks very much for watching.